it would happen over a few months and it really wasn't so much that I lost the money. It was the fact that I was losing everything. I didn't, I didn't quantify it yet. I thought I was set for life. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page, and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is the man, the myth, the legend, Rod Cleef. I am super excited to have him on. I was talking with him before we hit the record button, how he's one of my top uh, five dream guests to have on the show. And I'm not going to go through his background because most of you that listen to my show know who he is and know what he does. So Rod, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come and join me on the show today. I love it. Average Joe. I love it. You 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 resonate with with anybody with that with that title and we're all average joes, you know. I I love that title. Thanks for having me on, brother. Let's have some fun today. Absolutely. That's what I'd love to do. Because I'm not going to go all up into your background because we know who you are, but I'd like to hear your description of your story. So if you could just share with us who is Rod Cleef? How did sure. you get started and what motivates you to just do what you do every day? A great, great question, actually, especially the last part. Well, listen, let me let me go way back. So I immigrated to this country when I was six years old. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands, you know, wooden shoes and windmills, Holland, and uh, came across when I was six with my brother, Albert, my mother's Vancha, and um, we ended up in Denver, Colorado. And, and I'm going to tell you, we didn't have a lot starting out. In fact, we had very little. Uh, I remember uh, my mom bought clothes for us at the Goodwill and the Salvation Army. And, you know, we, we ate expired food. There was an expired food store. We drank powdered milk with our cereal in the morning. And it doesn't, it's not nearly as nice as it sounds. And, and you know, we really struggled initially. Now, um, luckily, though, my mom had an incredible work ethic. And so she babysat kids so we'd have enough money to eat and be able to do some things. And and um, with her babysitting money, she was a bit of an entrepreneur and she actually invested in the stock market and made money, but she also invested in real estate. So the first house she bought was directly across the street from us, from a family called the Jewels. And she paid about $30,000 for it. And then she told me, and this was when I was about 14, when I was 17, she told me she made $20,000 in her sleep and that, that had gone up in value 20,000. I'm like, what? You didn't do anything back then. This is okay. We're talking 1977, 20,000 was a lot of money. I'm like, shit, mom, I'm not getting into real estate. I mean, I'm not going to college. I'm getting into real estate. So I went out and got my real estate broker's license right when I turned 18, which you could do back then with education. Now they got smart. You need some experience before you can be a broker. But I was a broker literally right when I turned 18. And I was going to be rich selling other people's houses. And listen, it's a great place to start. But most people don't get rich from selling other people's houses. And, um, you know, my first year in real estate, I maybe made about eight to 10 grand that's, that's 1978. Um, my second year, maybe 10 to 12 grand. But my third year, I made over $100,000, which again, back, you know, 19, what is that, 1980, that was some decent change. So what happened between year two and year three that caused me to 10x my income? Well, what happened was I met a guy that taught me about the importance of mindset and psychology. How really 80 to 90% of your success in anything is just that, your mindset and your psychology. Fast forward to today, you know, I've owned a couple thousand houses that I rented long term. Um, I've now owned thousands of apartment units. In 2006, 
my net worth went up $17 million while I slept. And if you want to do the math on that, it's about $8,300 an hour over a 40-hour work week, which of course I did. And anybody that holds still long enough heard that. And you know, my head got so big, I could barely fit it through a door. I thought I was a freaking real estate god. And you know when that happens, God of the universe will give you a nice little smack. Well, that was 2008. <laughs> I lost everything in 2008. I lost $50 million conservatively. And so, you know, one of the things I like to talk about is the mindset it took that 50 million to lose in the first place, but really maybe even more importantly, the mindset it took to recover from losing $50 million. And so, you know, if you'd like, I'd, I'm happy to drill down on that conversation and, and, and how that happened. Yeah. So before we get to that, I, I just want to know what mm -hmm. was that initial, I guess, shock factor when, when the market crashed back in 08 and you saw that your net worth just plummeted $50 million. What was your first reaction? What went through Rod Cleef's head? Well, it was, it was, it, it would happen over a few months and it really wasn't so much that I lost the money. It was the fact that I was losing everything. I didn't, I didn't quantify it yet. I thought I was set for life. You know, I, by the way, I was only at a 30% loan to value when it crashed, okay? I only owed 30 cents on the dollar and I still crashed. And here's why, people ask why. So I had 800 houses and I had several apartment complexes. It was the houses that pulled me down. See, I had houses <clears throat> two hours north of me, two hours south of me and everywhere in between along the Gulf Coast of Florida. And Florida has no state income tax, okay? So the property taxes are higher, which impacts cash flow, right? I had properties in wind and flood zones. So I had higher insurance, which impacts cash flow. But what killed me was the logistics. If I sent, you know, uh, somebody to one of my apartment complexes to fix something maintenance related, you know, we can stockpile parts. Everything's the same. The plumbing parts are the same. The locks, the appliances, the, the windows, um, you know, the HVAC, it's all the same. And so you can stockpile parts and they can be in and out in an hour. Well, if I just send someone to one of my houses and it's an hour and a half away, then they'd have to, every house is different. They have to go see what's wrong. Then they, once they see what's wrong, they got to go find a Home Depot or a Lowe's where we have an account, which could be another hour round trip. And I don't know about you, Mike, but anytime I go to fix something, Rod ends up back at Home Depot or Lowe's to, for a second trip because I missed something. And, you know, that, that happens. And what took an hour at one of my apartment complexes could take all day at one of my house, you know, one of these 800 houses. And these were C-class houses. And so, you know, those, those get beat up a lot more than an A or B-class property, okay? Even in the apartment communities, a C-class apartment community, you're going to have a lot more maintenance for a lot of reasons. One is the demographic that lives there, but also the age of the asset, you know, so a lot more maintenance. And so that killed me. And But then the coup de grace, as it were, the, the, the final straw was I didn't really pay attention to demographics back then. You know, if somebody had good credit and a decent job, um, I let them rent my place. Well, a lot of my tenants were were in retail or they were contractors, plumbers, electricians, drywallers, roofers, painters, which fell off a freaking cliff in 2008 and nine. Nobody had work. And so, you know, now, for example, we just bought a 296 unit asset in San Antonio a few months ago. And I literally looked where every single tenant worked to see how recession resistant their employment was. And, and, and so now I take it very seriously, you know, hit me once, shame on you, hit me twice, it's my own damn fault. But, uh, you know, so, so that's why, you know, I imploded. And, and literally what's interesting is I was a 30% loan to value in 2007. By 2009, my portfolio value had gone upside down. Okay, it dropped more than 70% where I live here in Florida, which is just astounding. But, uh, and, you know, and then, then I crashed and burned. But what went through my mind? Uh, kind of, uh, oh, shit. And, uh, you know, I hid under a rock for a few months and, and you know, just want a little eyeball poking out and hid. You know, if I hadn't done that, though, I would have capitalized on that crash. And, and I'm kicking myself because b the biggest money is made in a situation like that. And I could have bought assets for literally cents on the dollar, but I was licking my own wounds you know, in recovery. Now I built a company out of the ashes of that. I built a company that turned into a $10 million company with 60 employees. But, you know, I wish I'd have just stuck with real estate. And, uh, you know, and I, and, 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 you know, before we move on uh, to, you know, more mindset conversation, I want to say this, I believe a contraction is coming at some point and, and real estate goes through cycles. I've been through several of them. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we've been in in high growth for a long time. And, and at some point, there's going to be a catalyst and there's going to be a contraction. And, and I don't say that to make you fearful if you're listening or watching, because with crisis comes opportunity. And there was incredible opportunity in 08 and 09 for the people that capitalized on it. Uh, but, um, 
you know, like I'm getting in a lot of cash right now. I want to be very cash heavy right now and access to cash as well. Just, you know, I'm telling my investors, you know, when the quote unquote blood is running in the streets, then we're that, that's when we're really going to pounce so that they're not afraid of it. Because, you know, the news will be, oh, my God, real estate's going to be terrible for 10 years. Don't don't invest in real estate. You know, they're not the news isn't there to inform us. It's there to startle us. And we won't go down that rabbit hole about fake news. But but anyway, but the point is, <clears throat> don't be afraid of a contraction. You know, because again, with crisis, there'll be incredible opportunity. So long answer to your question. No, I, I love it. That's fantastic because that, that's huge, right? You know, yeah. any type of crisis is going to cause some type of opportunity. I mean, you even see it in the stock market as well, right? It's not just in the housing market. What was that famous saying that that Warren Buffett said, right? Like if everyone else is like getting out, that's oh, the he's time a contrarian, that you get in, right? Right. Yeah. So that's, you know. If, yeah. if the guys that are that are doing really well in the industry are saying to do that and that's what they do and they practice what they preach, it's probably good to follow what's going on there. And yeah. and with where your thought process is right now, with you think a contraction's gonna be coming and you're you're prepping for that. And you know, mm-hmm. I, I guess like the big thing is, is it is it what happened to you in 08? Like did this did this do something to shift your mindset to really focus on on how you look at situations like this versus sure. You know, sure. just sure. Let me address that. Yeah. Let me address that. So, so listen. Um, you know, a lot of you know my podcast. I I I have lots of guys with five, six, seven thousand units, and many of them started in 09, 10, and eleven. So they didn't. They haven't been through a crash, and you know everything looks great until it doesn't. And I'm seeing some deals where we get in best and final, and they trade at a price that just floors me. Okay. And I'm and and I'm going to tell you if there's a hiccup, some of these deals are going to fail, and you know I'll be there to buy them. But the point is, you know, there the, right now is not a time to be super aggressive. It's a time to be super conservative, and 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 it's it's going to mean you kiss a lot of frogs. I mean, seriously, you could be looking at three, four hundred assets to find one right now that makes sense. Uh, but but that's prudent, and the and and that's why Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have pulled back in a lot of markets. They've lowered their proceeds. You know, like um, um, in San Antonio, for example, you're, you're about 55, 60% loan to value is all you're going to get because, you know, uh, uh, these markets, you know, certain markets that they that they that they quantify, they're not going to do higher leverage on. Um, but, you know, all, almost the entire country had big rent increases this last year. And, you know, uh, Tampa, for example, I think 20 percent San Antonio, I just mentioned because that's where asset that one asset is 18 percent in one year. That's rent growth, just astounding. But that's not sustainable. And you know, and you'll see some of these operators will throw a, a, a pro forma out there, and they'll have you know five percent growth a year for the next three years, and that's just unrealistic because right? you know there's gonna it's gonna there's gonna be a pullback here at some point. It's just the way you know it, it, real estate goes through cycles. I've been through several of them. I'll give you an example of one. Uh, one in the late '80s. I, I I give a personal example of a house. This is on a house. So I bought this house. Back in I don't know 87, 88 for say fifty six thousand. These are rough numbers, but I and I and I flipped it, sold it for seventy six thousand, made a nice chunk. Well, that the market crashed. I bought that same house back for eighteen thousand. Okay, bought it for fifty six, sold it for seventy six, bought it back for eighteen. Ultimately, sold it for one sixty. Now, to really add pain to the story, that area gentrified and it's now worth around a million. Okay. It's on 30th and federal in Denver, if you know Denver. But anyway, so, so, you know, that's, that's an example of what can happen. And, you know, hopefully we won't have that dramatic of a contraction again, like in 08 and 09, but it's inevitable. It, it, it's like life, like life and like weather. Real estate goes through seasons, and and we have been in summer for a very long time. We were absolutely in fall, and winter we know what is coming. Fall. Winter as, is as coming. A, not something to fear, right? Exactly, not something to fear. Something to be ready for, for and cognizant of, right. and get it, frankly get excited about. Honestly, that's the best way to 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 frame it. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to I want to touch back to that property that that you talked about that you flipped uh, mm-hmm. back in the eighties because I I just have to know. I'm just curious. Mm-hmm. So the the person you sold it to, right? And you got that nice little chunk of change, and they then lost you repurchased it, it in eight for eighteen thousand. Did you repurchase yeah. it from them, or was it no no no? Else? It was a bank repo. It was no. Oh, it already wow. gone back to wow, the wow. bank. Yeah, it had gone back to the bank. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I was. Just there was another one that. I sold for fifty six. I bought back for twelve. I mean, with oh. same house. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So, you know, a a lot of this, what we're talking about here, especially with the, 
you going through this a, a few times, right? Where some people have not gone through it at all. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is where we have these opportunities to learn from somebody who's experienced, who's been through this, right? Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for those of us who just started not too long ago, we're still wet behind the ears, so to say, right? Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity to learn. And with that being said, part of that learning process is also your mentality and your psychology. And we've been touching a lot about that on this. So why would you say someone's psychology is more important than any type of like technical knowledge when it comes to this type of sure. uh, investing or just entrepreneurship in general? Life, honestly, life, uh, period. Life is 80 to 90% psychology and mindset. Success in anything is 80 to 90% psychology and mindset. Listen, if it was just the mechanical information, there'd be a bunch of wealthy librarians and college professors out there. It's the do and it's the keep doing. Most people have limiting beliefs. They have fears. They are maybe they're comfortable. And the comfort zone is a warm place, but nothing freaking grows there, right? And so you've got to have um, enough uh, oomph as it were, burning desires, what Napoleon Hill calls it in his book, Think and Grow Rich, you've got to have a burning desire. So how did I recover from losing $50 million? I reassociated with my goals, with what I wanted, and more importantly, why I wanted it. Because the goals, doing your goals is what creates that burning desire. And so if you come to one of my boot camps, I just had 800 people in Orlando a couple months ago. I, I do I do a couple of boot camps a year. I do uh, two live ones and two virtual ones. I happen to have one coming up here uh, in a couple months. Uh, but uh, bottom line is, the first thing we do there is we do a goal setting workshop because you know, how the hell are you going to get anything if you don't know what it is? You've got to know what it is you want and why you're doing it. And so, again, that's the first thing we do at my events because it's the most important piece. Um, you know, again, so many people and, and a lot of people in this multifamily business are very analytical. OK, They're, they come from an IT background, engineering background, a technical background. And of course, they are very often they're introverted, and, but they're certainly analytical. And, and very often they get caught up in analysis by paralysis and they don't take action. And so it's so important to associate with what you want. And this, again, this is how I recovered. This is how I had 50 million to lose in the first place because I had these goals that I went through. And then this is how I recovered by reassociating with those goals. And so, you know, uh, and, and, you know, initially my goals were all materialistic. I've got this, like, I'll show you something. This is my planner. In the back of this thing, I've got goals that I've had for 20 years. Now, the first th first picture, I've got these pictures. If those of you that are listening, you can't see this. I've got these, uh, I use a paper planner. I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but I've got plastic covered pictures in the back of this thing. And the first pictures are my gratitude pictures. The pictures of my kids when they were very young. My kids are 30 and 26 now. So these are when they were kids and baby. Um, and because everything starts from a place of gratitude, you've got to, you know, to manifest anything, you've got to know what it is you want. And then you've got to visualize it with gratitude as if you already have it. So I've got my gratitude pictures here. Then I've got pictures of the things that I wanted, which I thought were important. I've got this, you know, I built this $8 million house on the beach, which I thought was important at the time. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and that looks just like it, that top picture, the bottom picture looks like the compound that I have now. I lost that house on the beach that I built, you know, and all the craziness with my divorce and everything. Uh, now what's kind of funny is I live in a compound. I've got six buildings and uh, and right out, and right across the bay is the old house that I used to own. It's literally right out my wow. backyard. It's hilarious. <laughs> Just but then, you know, reminder. other pictures, other pictures, you know, stuff that I thought was important. I don't, you know, watches. I got a few hundred thousand in watches. Stupid shit. You know, the cars, the Lamborghinis, the Rolls Royces, the Bentleys, all the stupid stuff I thought was important at one time. But I have pictures and I made them happen. Um, and and again, you may not have any interest in this materialistic stuff. And I don't even anymore that much. You know, I occasionally I'll buy a nice watch for myself, but that's about it. But the point is, you need these things to get that burning desire. Maybe for you, it's freedom. Maybe for you, it's a house, you know, on a uh, on a farm. Maybe it's on a lake. Maybe it's on the beach. You know, maybe it's in another country, a second home, whatever. Whatever is, is going to be the drive. Maybe it's doing something for someone else. That's hugely important. You know, we'll do more for others than we'll ever do for ourselves. So defining what is going to drive you. And defining why it's going to drive you is the most important piece of this because you've got to have that burning desire to push through the fear, to get out of analysis paralysis. I just interviewed this kid on my show who's in my coaching program. He's been, he joined in June of last year. He has 35 million in assets, six deals that he's purchased in the last seven months. 
Okay. And he's analytical. He's an IT professional. And I'm like, you know, how did you do that? You know, push through that analysis. And he's, you know, he listened to me and he pushed, took massive freaking action, made a decision and, you know, did everything he did to get to, could do to get the first deal done, which is always the hardest, by the way, there's that law of the first deal. It's the hardest. It's the most stressful. It's the scariest. Got that done and boom. And, you know, I was in six and seven months. I mean, it's just extraordinary. And, but you know what else is extraordinary? And I got to give him a shout out. His name's Amant. He has donated 90% of his wealth so far to, to, to 24 kids that were, that were in sex trafficking. He's adopted seven families. I'm just so blown away. This Literally, this interview was just right before this one, and so it's fresh with me. Just extraordinary. You know, power moves to those who serve, and this guy gives back in a huge way, and it's just so impressive to me. He's one of my coaching students, my warriors, and you know, just to brag a little further, um, you know, I've been teaching for about four years. My warriors now own over 50,000 units, and I'm really freaking proud of that. You know, um, it's my greatest achievement next to my kids, my greatest achievement in life. So anyway, yeah, I'm that's, one of the, that's one of the things I love. Like when I, so I listen to your show, right? So one of the Thank things you. I love is every time that updates and that those numbers go up in your intro and stuff, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. And, you know, Th this young man that you say you interviewed uh, recently, I mean, that that is phenomenal. What right? an incredible person. Right? Oh, I yeah. couldn't believe it, man. When I read that on his bio, I'm like, shit, I didn't know you. He said he never told anybody that he's 90% of his money has gone to these 24 kids that he's supporting. And I'm like, I, I, blown away. Sorry, seriously blown. I mean, I do charitable things. I've done a lot of cool stuff that I'm really proud of. But man, that just blew me away, honestly. Absolutely incredible. And, and I want to, I want to rewind back to a little bit to what you were saying about, you know, having that burning desire, right? And, mm -hmm. and a lot of it, you know, some people will just sit here and they get caught up in that analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I hear you talk about all the time on your show is taking massive action, right? Mm -hmm. And that's super important. And, but to, to top that off, you can't take that action until you know your why, right? You need to know why it is you're doing yeah. what you're doing. You have to have that that end goal in sight. Cause if you don't, I mean, it, you could move the goalpost. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, you set the standard where you want to set the standard, but if you don't set some type of standard or set some type of goal, you're, you're just out there floundering around. Let's, let me talk for a minute about moving the goalposts, if you don't mind, because, sure. um, you know, I told you about that $8 million house on the beach that I built. Okay. I mean, this place was spectacular. Okay. I mean, truly, I mean, I'll, I'll describe it real briefly. Um, it was, you know, I owned the beach on one side and I had my boats on the backside. It's called a Gulf to Bay. So it was a slice through an island. And it's literally right out my backyard here on Casey Key. But um, I mean, the house had a giant spiral staircase that went up through the middle of the house. There was a giant waterfall from the second floor balcony into the pool. You had to walk through the waterfall to get into the pool. It pools in magazines. You know, it had a wine cellar, elevator. Um, <clears throat> on the second floor, I'll land the plane with this. On the second floor, I had aquariums built around that spiral staircase. It cost me almost 200 grand. So this gives you an idea of the house. Well, Two, I worked for this thing for 20 years because I lived in Denver and I knew I wanted to live on the beach and there's no beach in Denver, but I would visualize the palm trees and the surf and the sand and all that stuff. And, and 20 years later, I built this thing and two months after I moved in, so I worked for it for 20 years, two months after I moved in, I'm floating up in my pool at night. I'm looking up at this testament to my ego, which is really what it was. It was to prove the world I was good enough. And that's the truth of it. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, that's a, that was a driver for me was to prove to the world that I mattered and that I was good enough. Cause I went through school and I got bullied a lot and had, you know, everybody has this stuff happen to them, but that actually really impacted me. And so I'm looking up at this testament to my ego that I built two months after I moved in and I got depressed. And I don't mean just a little bit depressed. I mean, I was really freaking depressed. And I'm like, what the hell? I've just, I've got this $8 million house. I've got the Mercedes and the Maserati in the garage. I've got the boats and the jet skis and the beautiful family. What could possibly be wrong? Well, it ties into what you said about moving the goalposts. See, there were several things happening, but one of them was you should never achieve a big goal without having other goals lined up behind it. And that's moving the goalposts. So it's like, what am I going to do next? Because like the good book says, without the, without a vision, the people perish. I didn't know, I didn't have a vision for the future. So that was number one. Number two is it's never about the goals. You got to have them. You got to have them to do anything, but it's the happiness comes from progress and growth. If you're not progressing and growing, you're not happy. Okay. That's a critical piece. And so one of the things I teach my students is I don't care if, if you did one little thing for five minutes that week, when you're doing your weekly planning, celebrate it, pat yourself on the back because you're going to have delays. You're going to have setbacks, but if you're celebrating your progress, you'll be happy. So that was the second thing. But the third thing was the big one. I had been totally focused on me, you know, show the world I'm good enough, show the world I matter, me, 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 rod, 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 rod. Well, 
I went to a Tony Robbins event that year, actually, because I, I went out and bought some books and I'm going to get back. I'm not going to go lay on a couch and bemoan my circumstances. I'm going to get some books. I'm going to be back. I'm tough. Now, I don't I, I am now actually an advocate for therapy because I did some after my divorce. But, you know, at that time I wasn't. And and um, but um, so I, I got a Tony book. I'm like, man, I really like this. So I went and saw him and I saw that he fed families for the holidays. I'm like, what a concept, you know, do something for someone else someday. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I had to be 40 to get that memo. But um, so I went back home and I called my brother because I was going to go visit him in Denver. And I said, hey, let's feed five families for Thanksgiving. I went and visited him for Thanksgiving. And so he went to his church and he got the, he said, who really needs help? And we got a list of five families and third family changed my life. I and mean, we bought big boxes of food. We found out if they had kids, we got toys for the kids. And, 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 you know, the third family uh, was in this crappy one bedroom row house. It wasn't even really a one bedroom because you had to walk through the bedroom to get to the kitchen. And there's a lady in there with five kids. Now she comes out, she sees this box of food, boxes of food, actually frozen turkey, toys, and she starts crying. And her kids come out, a, a couple of the older ones start crying. I start crying and I was freaking hooked. And so, you know, the next year I did 50 families. The year after that, 100 families, then 200, then 400, then 800, then 1,600. And I'm blessed to say I've now fed about 110,000 children here. I've done, you know, and I'm not saying this to brag. There's a message in this. So stay with me here. Um, I've done tens of thousands of backpacks filled with school supplies to local children. I've done tens of thousands of teddy bears to, for officers to put in their vehicles. Uh, when they encounter a child that's been traumatized, they can comfort that child. And see, I was successful, but I was unfulfilled. Tony, Tony Robbins, I'll reference him again, calls it the science of achievement versus the art of fulfillment. And, and, and really fulfillment really is an art. And so here's the thing. If you're listening to Mike and you might be really hungry, you haven't done this yet, you got blood dripping from your teeth, you want this so freaking bad. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you're not giving back, start immediately. I'm going to tell you almost all my warriors, my thousand mentorship students give back in some fashion. I just gave you an incredible example of that. Why? Because you've been taught and you believe that you have to achieve to be happy. I'm going to tell you, if you give back, even in a little way, you're happily achieving. Okay. And I know that sounds like a play on words, but it's an important play on words. Okay. Because what you give, you get back a thousand fold. There's a reason that kid, kid he's a kid, he's young, quite a bit younger than Haman, has you know, $35 million in assets and joint ventures and, and, and syndications that he's done six deals because he gives back. Okay. Cause what you give, you get back a thousand fold. So again, I don't care if you tell me I'll do it when I have money. No, do it now. Do something. I don't care if it's just helping one family or one elderly person do it now because you'll be happily achieving. And I'm going to tell you, you will get the success much faster. You don't do it for that reason, but you'll get it much faster. Anyway, I just wanted to mention no, that I, you said move the goalposts, and I spent ten minutes. Talking I love why that. that's all right. Good. Oh yeah, why that's important because it is important, yeah. right? And then yeah. celebrating when you do achieve these mm -hmm. victories and you achieve those goals because Super you know important. You, when you're talking about how you got to that point where you had the eight million dollar house, you had everything that you had set out to achieve and get, mm -hmm. and now you're laying there like, what's well, next? Yeah. Well, you didn't know what was next at that point, no. right? So it was just no. like, what do I really have? Because if you don't have a goal, you don't have anything. Because how do you live a life of abundance when you're not you need, exactly when you're not you consistently for moving forward? Yeah, absolutely love that. And then you know your philanthropy too. I mean, the the way it started off, just five families, right? And then how it grew grew and blew up into to what it is today is just yeah. absolutely amazing, Rod. And I, just, I thank you. I want to say thank you for everything that you've done for for multiple communities not not just the, the things that you've done in the local area but you've you've done things for multiple communities and you. Uh, you know I, I follow some of that stuff that you do it's just absolutely amazing just well, by me, the way by the I way say thank you know you. i do a lot of stuff for veterans as well and and yes. and thank you for your service brother i mean uh, honestly we live in the greatest country on earth because of people like you. And I know you're close to retirement in the Navy and that's extraordinary. And, you know, I have done quite a bit for veteran suicide and veterans, how veterans housing and so on and so forth. Um, um, yeah. In fact, my mastermind just raised 25,000 for, um, for veterans housing, these little micro houses. Awesome. Uh, um, so anyway, yeah, yeah no, you did that I with uh, Eric, right? Eric. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, yep, sir. Yep. Yep. Awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah actually, I, I've been following that for, for a while. Nice. Uh, nice. What, what they're doing, what the active duty passive income guys are doing mm -hmm. is just absolutely amazing, especially for yep. veterans. 
And, you know, I want to touch on something and, and I want to thank you again for what you said about the, you had mentioned that, you know, you, you just toughed it out in the beginning. You're like, Hey, I'm just going to get a couple books, go, go mm -hmm. figure this out on my own. Cause you know, I'm, I'm a man. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that's the mentality for a, a lot of people that I've served with in the military as well. Myself mm -hmm. included. There's a lot of times where you're just like, I, I don't, I don't ask for help. I don't need mm -hmm. the help. So I just want to point that out for, for those that are listening right now that, Hey, if somebody who had lost $50 million bounce back from that to get to where they're at today can say, and, and just run all these successful businesses and help so many people, but can still turn around and say, I need help when I need help. That's, that just shows that that goes to show you the character of, of who Rod is. So well, thank you. Again, I thank want to you, say buddy, for that. No, listen, learners are earners, you know, and, and, and I, I, I share this uh, picture of, with me, with hundreds of lanyards around my neck and on my arms, my arms are extended. You know these boot camps because I, I I'm learning every year. I remember my son when I had 800 houses. I told him I was going to a you know a single family house boot camp, and he's like, "But you could teach it." And I'm like, "Yeah, I could, but I'm going to learn." And so you know this was decades ago, but I remember that conversation vividly. And 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 so guys, you know the learning doesn't stop. Okay, and again, it's it's about growth and 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 moving forward and. And that's, uh, it relates to that conversation. You want to be happy, keep, keep growing. You have to keep growing. You have to be, keep becoming better. You stop growing, you're dying. You're not plateau. You actually start dying. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, fantastic. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, just, just awesome. Amazing story, Rod. So I'd like to move on to the next segment here. Uh, it's called the final round. I've got four questions that I'd like to ask you. It's something I started doing that I ask everybody that comes on the show. And I'm pretty excited to hear your answers because this is, you know, you may have actually touched on some of this stuff already, but this is something that really, uh, for me, being a podcaster, it's one of the things I get to do that's a little bit selfish. I get to ask you the questions that I want to ask you and pick your brain. And uh, these are four questions I like to ask everybody because I, I, I really feel like it gets some good, honest things coming out. If you're okay. ready, we'll get this party started. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, so the first question, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Well, I t one of them was was hiding under a rock when 09 happened, when I could have, I mean, I had the experience to go out there and literally, you know, join a team and buy thousands and thousands of properties um, if I hadn't been, you know, licking my wounds. So that was a huge one. Um, you know, this one's, this is off real estate, but staying in, in my previous marriage longer than I should have, because I thought it was the best thing for the kids. I, I'm, I now have, I'm married to the most beautiful, extraordinary, I mean, literally physically supermodel, beautiful woman, but she's more beautiful on the inside than the outside. And, and if I, you know, I probably wouldn't have met her though, if I'd have done it quicker. So, you know, things work out, but, but I did stay in that relationship too long. So that was a big mistake. Um, my kids, you know, are, are incredible, but, um, you know, I, I wish I hadn't done that. Let me think, let me give you another one. Um, you know, probably not going bigger faster. And I asked that question of my guests as well. If you tell your 18 year old self something, what would you do differently? And I, I, I'm expecting the answer that I just gave you, which is go bigger faster. You know, people have these mental limits they place on what they're capable of. Um, and I would just tell you to push those limits. If you're about to get into this business and you're looking at a duplex, look at a 10 unit. If you're looking at a 10 unit, look at a 50 unit, bring in money, bring in friends, do what you have to do. Come to my boot camp for God's sakes. You know, my virtual boot camps are around a hundred bucks and I don't sell anything there. And the, uh, I'll give you the website. It's multifamilyvirtualbootcamp.com. And for my virtual events, my live ones is just multifamilybootcamp.com. But, you know, if you text multifamily to 72345, Whatever event, whenever you post this thing, whatever event I'm doing next will come up. So it's multifamily to seven, two, three, four, five. And, you know, um, I've had thousands of people attend. The only complaint I ever get that the breaks are too short or the room's too cold or the food sucked or something is never about the content because I massively over deliver. But if you're serious about learning this business, I hope you come check one of my events out. I, I promise you, promise you, you'll be glad you came. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So anyway, mistakes done with that. Awesome. One. No, fantastic. And, and and one of the things you said kind of ties into what the next question is, and that is, yeah. what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? Well, this is this is you know I've I've built twenty seven businesses, and I don't call my failures failures. I call them seminars, and that was a fifty million dollar seminar. Well, out of those twenty seven businesses, I had several that were worth tens of millions of dollars. These businesses, but most were spectacular, flaming seminars. And one of the reasons was. I looked for the cheapest help I could find to conserve capital because after I lost my first business, I'm like, man, I got to save money and be careful with it. And I got to tell you, that was a mistake. Look for the best people you can possibly find 
and pay more because they'll they'll massively over deliver uh, compared to two or three weak people. And so that was a that was a big mistake I made trying to save money on human resource, you know, on people. Big mistake. And and I've come to that realization. I just hired a COO at a significant salary today, actually. And I've I've finally got that memo that you want the best people you can find either hire or work with or partner with. That's fantastic. I wrote that one down because, you know, even even on smaller projects too, you know, I outsource some things. I've got virtual assistants that I use for different projects. And I find that if I if I spend a little bit more on the budget, I get a, a lot more bang for the buck in the, in the long run. So that is absolutely key, 100%. Okay, next question. Do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started today? Well, first of all, to succeed in anything, you need to be passionate. To be passionate, you have to love it, okay? And I tell my students, if you can't love real estate or learn to love it, now you can learn to love anything. You associate pleasure with it, okay? And you can associate pleasure to anything, exercise, whatever. But if you can't learn to love it, for God's sakes, go do something else. Because if you're not passionate, you're not gonna influence people to invest with you and work with you. Now, to be passionate, you have to be confident. Okay, so I'm backing into this. And to be confident, you have to be competent. So it starts with competence. You need to learn this. This is my, again, come to one of my boot camps. There, It's a song and a dance to come. It's I don't make hardly anything on the, the ticket prices. If you come into my coaching program, yeah, I make some money there, but I don't push that hard. I don't sell it. Actually, I don't even sell it. I, you know, if you want to talk to my team, great. But the point is, come to my boot camp. Because I'm not one of these things, one of these people that'll tease stuff and tell you a little bit. You it's drinking through a freaking fire hose. So if you're interested in multifamily, for God's sakes, come to one of my boot camps. I promise you'll be glad you came. Now, whatever the if it's not multifamily, go out and find an expert in whatever you know, sector of this business you're interested in. If it's self-storage, mobile home parks, you know, go find the expert and learn from them to become competent because to influence, you have to be confident and passionate. And that only comes from competence, from knowledge. Now, don't, don't those of you know, you know who you are, you analytical ones, you don't have to know every single step, uh, you know, you don't have to see the entire road, but you have to have a beginning level of competence, okay? Um, you know, you can drive all the way across this country at night seeing 50 feet in front of you and you know you'll make it. Other people have made it. You may have some roadblocks and some setbacks, but you know you'll make it. It's the same way with your goals. So don't hang your hat on the fact you have to know every single piece. You know, analytical people will have to check off every single box. They're the most successful in my business, by the way. If you're analytical, you are, you know, the poster child for success in multifamily because there's a lot of analytics involved. But don't use that as an excuse not to take action, which is what we see, you know, check off every box. So uh, I forgot what the question was, but hopefully that answered no, you, it. you definitely answered it. Okay. I just, I want to, I want to tell a quick story about that. that that's very relatable. Uh, this okay. is going back into my Navy days here, right? When I was getting qualified as officer of the deck, this is like the, the pinnacle qualification you can get on a ship. You are in charge of the safe navigation of the ship, wherever you're going, right? So as I was going through my qualification, the, the CEO had this one question that he said, pretty much everybody fails. Like everybody fails this question. They okay. put you in this absolutely insane scenario where you have multiple contacts, which is like other ships or other boats mm -hmm. in the water mm -hmm. that are all going to come across in a way that like collision is pretty much imminent. Mm -hmm. And most folks that answer this question get it wrong because they're, they're focusing on one little problem at a time trying to figure it out. And by the time they get to where they think they're at, another ship or boat collided with them. So the very first thing I said when when I was asked that question, I, I was given the scenario. I'm looking at it, and I said, "Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to slow. I'm going to slow the speed of the ship. I'm going to slow down so I have more time mm -hmm. to assess what's going on here." And mm -hmm. I think it, it it's just what reminded me of that what triggered that for me is when you were talking about you're driving down that highway at night, only seeing 50 feet ahead of you because you you know you talked about during the daytime you can see all the way down, right? Mm -hmm. But at nighttime. You're driving 50 feet ahead of you and there's going to be roadblocks. It doesn't mean it's going to stop you. You just need to assess that situation and figure out a way to navigate around that roadblock. So I wanted to touch on that because that I, I think that's absolutely huge. Absolutely. Well, it, it's 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 how you're going to get anything in life is is recognizing that, you know, on your path to those goals. Um, you may not know, you won't know the whole path. Like Dr. Martin Luther King said, you take that first step in faith, the next step will be revealed. Um, Lao Tzu, thousands of years ago, said the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, but you got to take that first step. 
Okay. You don't have to get stuck in analysis paralysis. You freaking go do it Absolutely. and you'll be glad you did. So that's, that's you know, one of my you know, favorite quotes too. Pe- people, people, people are fearful. They don't realize that action mitigates fear. It's counterintuitive. You take action and the fear dis- you know, dissipates. So action is critical. Yeah, absolutely. So love that. Love that. Okay. Final question of the final round here. And besides your own, Rod, do you have a favorite business, investing, or real estate related book or podcast or both? Well, let me give you some books. So my love language is gifts. Okay. And there's a book called The Five Love Languages. And by God, if you don't have it, haven't read it, you need to go get it. And I was blessed to have the author on my show. He's super, super nice guy. He's in his 80s. But, uh, you know, everybody feels love a certain way and they give love a certain way. My, my way of giving love is gifts. I know it's kind of weird, but I, my, I love giving my wife gifts. She never expects them, but that's my way of showing her love. Well, so my students get lots of gifts. Okay. And, and they literally get a book almost every month or some sort of a gift. And so let me give you some of the gifts, some of the books that I've given them. The first one I'll let's talk about is The Slight Edge. It's about those little decisions you make day in and day out, the little ones that don't amount to something that much right when you make them, but they accumulate and they traject your life up or down. Another one is Turning Pro by Stephen Pressman about, about stop, you know, if you're going to do something, stop being a freaking amateur and be a professional. Okay, Turning Pro. Another one is, uh, of course, uh, Gary Keller's One Thing. Uh, I, I, I was blessed to have uh, his co-author, Jay Papasan, on the show. And that's a fantastic book. Another one is Hal Elrod's Miracle Morning. Okay, about the, you know, how you start your morning with some meditation, some prayer, some journaling, some exercise. And, uh, and, and it's extraordinary what that does for your day. Let's think if I got any more. Well, that's enough. There you go. I got a few. Yeah, you, you cheated. You cheated, okay. but that's okay. Because those are all fantastic books. Oh, okay. okay. I, I said I said one. Do you well, have I know. I, I wanted to <laughs> over-deliver, okay? You want no, to be hey, a success, always, you massively always, over-deliver. Yes, always okay? under-promise and over-deliver. That's right. Fantastic. And, you know, and I hear you say that on your podcast all the time. So uh, that's just a testament to who Rod is, right? Over-delivering, even here in the end. Absolutely love it. Now, Rod... That was the final round, but I do have one more question for you, and it's probably the most important question of all because we've talked about your amazing background and story, just everything that you've done to the culmination to where we're at right now. And uh, people listening, my listeners are going to want to know more about you. They want to know who is Rod Cleef. Uh, and they want to know where they can find more information about you. So if you oh, could, thanks, buddy, I appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Opportunity. Do you have a, a website, social media? Well, I've got my I've stuff. got my podcast, of course. You know, it's yes. called Lifetime Cash Flow. We just broke twelve million downloads, which awesome I'm really podcast. proud of. So uh, Lifetime Cash Flow. Um, if you if you want to go online and find me, just do Real Estate with Rod, and it goes right to my website. Nobody can spell my name. It's rodcleef.com is my website, but Real Estate with Rod will take you there, and you'll see my events that are coming up. You'll see hundreds of videos, uh, books, free books. I've got books on every topic in this business you can get for free. Um, just a lot of articles, a lot of incredible resources at my website. But you know, if you're serious about this business, for God's sakes, come spend a couple of days with me. Uh, my live events are three days. My virtuals are two. I cram them into two. But uh, you know, you'll get a crash course in this business and, and start, that, start that level of competency that you need to go kick ass in this thing. Absolutely love it. So, hey, Rod, I'll make sure I have all the links to, to, you know, to make it easier for people to find you. If they want to practice their Google Foo, that's fine. But I want to try to make it as easy as possible. So everybody that's listening, you'll be able to find all the links on Rod in the show notes. Go check it out. Go check out his podcast. I'm telling you right now, it's on my weekly listen. I listen to it (laughs) on my commute to work every day. So it's absolutely phenomenal. Rod, this was truly a treat and a pleasure. I am so humbled and thankful that you took the time to to chat with me. I I know it's a little bit later over there, so I appreciate you taking the time being on the East Coast. I'm over here in Hawaii, so I I do really appreciate it. Oh, woe is you. Woe is you. (laughs) Hey, we both enjoy the sun and the beach, so there you go. That's right. That's right. Thanks, brother. It was a lot of fun, buddy. I'm really really impressed with you and what you've accomplished, and and, uh, and, uh, really, you, you came well, you did some incredible questions that I don't always always get when I'm interviewed. So it was a real fun for me as well. Awesome. I appreciate that. And aloha from Hawaii. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. 